Chapter Fourteen of the Friendship of Anne, a story by Ellen Douglas Deland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was the last night of the old year. The weather had been raw and cloudy all day, and shortly before six o'clock the rain began to fall, and the streets were now wet and dreary. One would not have suspected this, however to judge by the gay scene within the talbot stores a merry party of young people sat down to dinner at seven o'clock a cousin of anne who was also a cousin of will dana and who like him lived in baltimore was visiting her dolly fearing was spending the night there although her home was in new york but a few blocks away alec tracy had arrived and with ned fred merriam mr and mrs talbot and mrs dana who was mrs talbot's sister their number was ten the other guests who were bidden to the party were to come at nine o'clock i did an awfully queer thing i'm afraid mrs talbot said will dana i hope you will forgive me ned told me it was all right but i ought to have asked you first what is it willie asked the hostess i can't imagine your doing anything i could not forgive nor indeed anything that required forgiveness oh mother what blarney exclaimed ned with affected astonishment i wish she would say such things to me he added turning to molly dana the mutual cousin of himself and will you needn't worry retorted molly aunt carrie can't often be accused of harshness to you oh you spoiled one you indulged darling hark hark it is the lark molly is calling me a darling aunt edith what do you think of that but tell me what have you done willie said mrs talbot i really am curious to hear I have invited two fellows to come tonight without consulting you. I didn't run across them until just before I came in, and there wasn't time to ask you. Fortunately, just as I had left them, I ran into Nettie, and he said it was all right and followed them up and asked them himself. He knows them too. They are awfully good fellows. Murray used to be in our class. But their father died and left them pretty hard up so he had to give up college and go to work they are the stewarts said ned bob and murray stewart i always liked them bob the oldest one was a classmate of hugh's alec you know yes of course said alec i always liked them too murray was quite a chum of ours i thought they lived in baltimore so they did but it seems they have moved to new york i know them or at least i know the mother and eldest daughter said mrs dana carrie you know whom i mean you remember oh yes said mrs talbot those poor stewarts i am glad you asked the boys to come willie if i had known they were living in new york I should have called on their mother. We might go while you are here, Edith. I shall make a special point of it, for I was always so sorry for her. She has been through so much. Yes, it was a fearful experience, and they have taken it harder than many people would. They are very proud family and abnormally sensitive. Did you ever see the younger brother? asked ned of will dana the one who did it no i believe he is the most sensitive and proud of the family and he can't get over it somebody told me it has had an awful effect upon him poor fellow well it was a terrible thing but i don't see how he could be blamed for it suppose we don't talk about that now interposed mrs talbot willie i am very glad you asked them to come ned 
I want you to be especially cordial to them, as I shall be myself. I have the greatest sympathy for them, especially as you say they have lost their father and are left so poorly off. While this conversation was being carried on, Anne had been absorbed in a laughing controversy with her father and Fred Merriman, and had heard nothing of it. She was therefore quite ignorant of the fact that two of Sidney Stewart's brothers were coming to the house that evening, and later, when they arrived and were introduced to her by her brother, she merely supposed that they were two of his college friends, whom she had not happened to meet before, and whom he had invited without her knowledge. She greeted them with her accustomed cordiality, and decided with her usual rapidity that they were very nice-looking, and that she liked them. Ned then led them to some of the other girls to be presented, and Anne turned to her other guests, who were now nearly all there. Bertha Macy was among the last to arrive. She had purposely chosen to make a late entrance, for she wished to show the Talbots that she knew the ways of society, and this seemed to her to be an excellent method of proving it. She was very much overdressed, raked out in ruffles, flounces, and frills, and she wore numerous necklaces and bracelets which jingled with every movement and which made Fred Merriman compare her to the personage in Mother Goose who wore rings on her fingers and bells on her toes. Her hair had been elaborately arranged by a professional hairdresser, and the curls and puffs were a marvel of elegance. She greeted Mrs. Talbot and Anne with such effusiveness that she attracted the attention of all who happened to be near. Anne, this is too perfect, she exclaimed. I am so thankful I didn't have anything else on hand for tonight. It might have happened just the other way, for there is so much going on in the holidays. I simply couldn't have declined your invitation, though. I should have gotten out of the other somehow, you may be sure of that. She had planned this speech on her way from home. It would stamp her at once a girl of fashion and many engagements, she thought. And here is Dolly, she continued volubly. Girls, I am simply dying to tell you the most exciting thing. I don't know what you will say when you hear it. I had a letter today from Julia Clark, sixteen pages. You know she is staying with her aunt in Baltimore, and she has heard all about Sidney Stewart. The most awful thing, my dear. But Anne had turned away from her to speak to someone else, and Dolly took the opportunity to introduce Will Dana to Bertha. She had heard enough of the conversation at the dinner table to guess that Julia had written something about the mysterious troubles of the Stuart family which had been alluded to then, and she did not wish Bertha to go into any further particulars on such an occasion as this. Will Dina, being conveniently near, she called him up and presented him. Fred Merriam and Alec Tracy were in another part of the room, and Bertha soon found to her chagrin that they made no effort to come and speak to her. But Anne was a good hostess and kept a careful watch upon all her guests. She knew that Bertha was not popular with the boys who had met her at Kingsbridge, but she determined that at her house Bertha should have as good a time as possible. So shortly before supper was announced, she asked Ned to see that she had someone to take her in. Ned, who had counted on some thing quite different, gave up his own plans and gallantly asked Bertha himself, but he tried to soothe his own feelings by arranging that they should sit in a small room that opened from the supper room, where Ruth Carter and Murray Stewart, 
molly dana and alec tracy anne and fred merriman were also established it must be remembered that not one of them knew that murray stuart was the brother of sydney and that alec and fred although they had become so well acquainted with her at thanksgiving had never heard that she had once lived in baltimore anne had not heard the conversation about the stuarts which had taken place at the dinner table and murray stuart himself was ignorant of the fact that three of these girls were at the wickersham school in kingsbridge though sydney had mentioned anne talbot in some of her earlier letters he had never connected her in his mind with his friends at harvard and as sydney had not referred to her lately he had naturally forgotten that there was a girl at the school by the name of talbot bertha when he was introduced to her had not caught his name and afterward hearing him addressed as murray by the other boys supposed that to be his last name even had she known that it was a stuart it is scarcely possible that she would have thought of his possible relationship to sydney the young men had left them for a few minutes in order to bring them their supper and the four girls were alone when bertha again remembered the letter that she had received from julia clark that day and which had made so profound an impression upon her that even the excitement of a party at the talbots had failed to divert her mind from it altogether anne she exclaimed i must tell you about julia's letter you all will be interested even you miss dana though you are not at our school for it is the most awful tale i have never heard anything quite so frightful and for my part i don't think miss wickersham ought to have a girl at the school who has such connections as sydney has oh bertha began ruth carter i don't think this is a very good time ruth do let her tell it interposed anne this is the second time tonight bertha has begun to tell me about julia clark's letter i must say i should like to know what was in it i thought you would said bertha triumphantly well it is simply this she is the sister of a murderer what cried the girls bertha what do you mean just what i say her own brother actually killed somebody as she said these words with great emphasis murray stuart entered the room carrying a plate of salad and oysters in one hand and a cup of chocolate in the other he started slightly and the chocolate spilled over into the saucer i beg your pardon he said to ruth i flattered myself i was bringing you this with remarkable care ruth scarcely noticed what he was saying i can't believe it she said to bertha julia has gotten it wrong in some way indeed she hasn't replied bertha i only wish i had her letter by this time fred alec and ned had come in but bertha carried away by the importance of her news continued the subject the other girls listened to her eagerly enough now there is no doubt at all about its being true said bertha julia's aunt has always lived in baltimore and knew about it at the time of course she did not know such common people herself naturally julia's aunt would not know people who could be murderers it is just what i imagined i always thought she was awfully common and i knew there was some mystery of course though it never entered my head to suppose that sydney stuart's brother could be a murderer there was silence in the little room for an instant then murray stuart who had been standing behind ruth stepped slightly forward he motioned to his three friends to be silent 
they had all turned eagerly towards him wait said he very quietly his face was white and his dark eyes looked straight at bertha you have been misinformed miss macy i know the family miss sydney stewart's brother is not a murderer the tragedy that you have heard about was entirely result of an accident as every one knew at the time then he turned to ruth carter and began to speak of something else and the other men plunged eagerly into conversation and was clever enough to know that they had been treading on very dangerous ground and second these efforts to get away from it as did ruth carter and molly dana bertha scarcely knew what to make of it all she was angry with this mr murray as she still supposed him to be but there was no way of venting her wrath nor of continuing her tale of scandal for no one would listen to her they were all laughing immoderately at some joke of fred merriam's in which bertha failed to find anything at all amusing and would not pay the slightest attention to her ned talbot her own supper partner did nothing further towards entertaining her beyond bringing her some ice cream in fact his manner to her had become distinctly hostile and he devoted himself entirely to ruth carter bertha had suspected all along that he preferred ruth's conversation to her own and had brought her into this little room in order to be near ruth which added largely to her ill humor she decided in her own mind that a party at the talbots was not what she had supposed it would be and she actually almost wished that she had not come however no amount of snubbing from these snobs so she expressed it to herself would diminish the glory she had acquired in the eyes of her own circle by merely having been bidden to this exclusive house and her friends should never know what she had suffered there she saw ned talbot whisper something to anne which caused a most peculiar expression to pass over her face it seemed like a flash of horror followed by indignation then anne whispered something in reply that was short but very emphatic i think they are very rude to whisper that way thought bertha i am sure it is something about me they were becoming rapidly more indignant when anne having recovered her self-possession came and sat down beside her with some polite remark and then in a moment suggested that as they had finished their supper they should go out into the hall and wait for the old year to die and the new year to be rung in come alec said anne in her imperious fashion you don't want any more supper let us leave these greedy ones to finish without us that is a pretty way for your hostess to talk said ned laughing don't be frightened i'll stay with you and see that you have all you want to eat the little group soon dispersed and then ned had the opportunity that he had been waiting for he slipped his arm through that of murray stuart my dear fellow he whispered we wouldn't have had that happen for the world but there is no reason why you should care i don't know who that girl is that my sister has picked up at school and asked here but evidently she is not a person whose opinion would count for anything we all know the rights of the case and have nothing but sympathy for your brother that's all right old man said Burry. of course i understand how the girl happened to get it wrong i am only sorry that such a report should be out after all this time oh pshaw exclaimed ned impatiently you may be pretty sure it is just girls talk i don't believe anybody thinks such a preposterous thing is true you know how girls chatter 
some girls and probably this one and her correspondent have some grudge against your sister and this is their charming way of paying her off of course this miss macy wouldn't have spoken of it tonight if she had known who you are i will give her that much credit though i think it was a pretty unsafe business her speaking of the affair at all in a house where she is a stranger and not knowing how we might be connected with the people she was talking about it was very nice of you murray not to tell her just who you are oh i wouldn't have done that for anything it would have made everybody feel uncomfortable and as for the poor girl herself poor girl repeated ned and then they were joined by alec tracy and fred merriman i'm mighty glad to run across you again murray said alec i wish i had known miss sydney stewart was your sister when i met her she stayed a couple of days with my mother at thanksgiving and she's an awfully jolly girl why of course she did exclaimed murray she wrote home about being rescued by a mr tracy in a snowstorm and staying at his mother's house she never mentioned your name or of course i should have known don't let us lose sight of you again said fred merriman what are you doing now murray we have missed you out of the class thanks old fellow it was a hard pull to have to give up but i had to go to work i am in a bank downtown you may see me its president some day and then again you might not they all laughed and then they walked together into the hall mrs talbot was talking with bob stewart and she beckoned the young men to come to her i am perfectly delighted to see you and your brother here she said to murray in her charming cordial way i used to know your mother in baltimore and my sister mrs dana who is staying with me now knew her quite well we are coming to see her very soon will you tell her so with my love i did not know until to-night that she was living in new york or i should have called long before this and mother said ned it seems that one of murray's sisters is at the wickersham school is she oh i remember anne has mentioned her in her letters i am sure now this is all very nice and i am so glad you could come to-night or we should never have found it all out and murray stuart proud and sensitive as all his family were felt comforted by her cordial friendliness he knew that she was fully aware of the family history and also that she could not yet have heard of what had transpired in the supper room so that it was not in order to make amends for that painful incident that she was showing such kindness to his brother and himself and now anne came towards him she had disposed of bertha for the time by introducing some one to her who had not been with them i hope you won't hate us mr stuart because such a thing happened at our house she said with her usual frank impulsive heartiness her eyes were full of sympathy and kindness of course miss macy did not know and she doesn't yet i am so surprised to find that sydney is your sister we go back to school day after to-morrow more's the pity but it will be great fun to tell her that you and your brother were at my new year's party anne did not yet know the whole story ned had only been able to give her the barest facts but they were sufficient to make her understand that bertha's tale had been grossly exaggerated she was very indignant with bertha for having shown so little sense of what was proper as to tell such a tale on such an occasion and her wrath with her and her sympathy for the stuarts acting upon her excitable temperament that was so apt to carry her to extremes 
made her ready to overlook all of Sydney's supposed shortcomings in the matter of anonymous letters. She longed to get back to Kingsbridge and tell her so, in spite of her regret at returning to school. As for Bertha, she would soon tell her what she thought of her conduct. End of chapter 14 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter number 15 of The Friendship of Anne A story by Ellen Douglas DeLand This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. While all this had been taking place in New York, Life at Kingsbridge during the holidays had been very uneventful. Christmas Day had been made as pleasant for Sydney as was possible by the Misses Wickersham, but it was perfectly natural for Sydney to feel homesick, and one could not blame her for longing to be with her own family at such time. She struggled to overcome the feeling, or at least not to show it to anyone and in this she was partially successful. She looked at her presents and went to church, and ate her turkey as cheerfully as did the others to all appearances, and then in the afternoon she went off for a long walk with Miss Jenny Wickersham, whom of all the teachers she admired and loved the most. The Misses Wickersham, on their part, had grown to understand and like Sydney. Having her alone with them had shown them her charm and her sweet nature in a way that would never have been possible during school time. And quite unknown to herself, she had secured a firm place in the good opinion of all the sisters, including Miss Wickersham herself, and that in spite of the good lady's partiality for excellence in mathematics, the monotony of the days was varied by an occasional visit to the lady next door. Mrs. Braithwaite grew to depend upon her coming, and it soon became an established habit for Sydney to run in to see her nearly every day. Of course, it would not be possible to continue this custom when school began again, but during the holidays the Mrs. Wickersham were only too glad to have Sydney do it. They were sorry for their blind neighbor and sorry for the young girl herself, who naturally must be very lonely. And so vacation wore away, and at last the 2nd of January came, the day upon which the pupils were to return to Kingsbridge. The first to arrive were those who lived in the neighborhood of Boston. Elsie Brent was one of these, for her home was in Cambridge. When the sleigh that brought them from the station drew up at the door of the Wickersham School, and the door was opened by Sydney herself, Elsie's heart gave a great thump. She had been longing to see her friend all through the holidays, and had been wondering how she was getting on alone. She had wished more than once she could have asked her to be her guest in Cambridge. Perhaps Sydney could have afforded the shorter journey but she had not been able to invite her, and had been forced to content herself with writing frequent letters. Now, although she was so glad to see Sydney again that it seemed as though the whole world had changed, no one would ever have guessed it. She did not offer to kiss her, but held out her hand with an awkward movement, and when Sydney threw her arms about her neck and hugged her, and exclaimed, Oh! I am so glad you have come back, Elsie. She merely said, How are you? Don't strangle me. She was really so touched by this warm greeting that she would have cried if she had said more. The tears were in her eyes, but she turned quickly away that Sydney might not see them. It was real torture to Elsie to know that she was showing emotion, even to her dearest friend. I have something to surprise you with, said Sydney. I don't believe you'll ever guess what it is. 
and I can scarcely wait to tell you. I do hope you will like it. A wild thought darted through Elsie's mind, but she immediately put it aside as being too wonderful to bear the slightest chance of being true. What is it? she asked. Oh, something. I'm not going to tell you until you get upstairs to your room. You will find it there. Elsie's heart, which had been beating rapidly in spite of her intention to be calm, subsided again. For a brief instant she had allowed herself to hope that she was to share Sydney's room for the remainder of the year, but if the surprise was awaiting in her own room, this could not be it. Now, said Sydney, when they reached the third floor, I am going to blindfold you. Here is a big handkerchief already. She shook out a silk handkerchief and then folded it and tied it around Elsie's head under her hat. What's up? asked one of the girls who also had just arrived. Blind man's bluff? Not quite. A surprise for Elsie. Now I'll turn you around three times and lead you to your room, and then I'll take off the handkerchief and you'll see it. She did this, and Elsie was led along the corridor, followed by a number of girls who had gathered to watch this strange proceedings. They were all merry and happy and forgotten for the time, being that when they left Kingsbridge it had been their custom to treat Sidney Stewart with cold politeness. The Christmas spirit of peace had not yet faded away, and there was no one there to remind them that there was any reason for disliking her. Sydney, with many intentional deviations in her course, led Elsie to the room which she herself had once shared with Bertha Macy, but which she had occupied alone during the last part of the term. Then she untied the bandage. There! she exclaimed. Elsie looked around. Her own pictures and books were arranged on the walls and table. Her own steamer rug lay across the foot of one of the beds. Her own pin cushion adorned one of the bureaus. And yet this was Sydney's room, the corner room with the two windows and the braithwaite place to be seen from one of them. She looked at the room and she looked at Sydney, and then she allowed herself to believe that her wish had come true. Am I to be here? she asked, half in a whisper. Yes, are you glad? Glad? It was all she ever said on the subject, but Sydney had no doubt about it. Already she was beginning to understand Elsie's deep, undemonstrative nature. There are many such natures, and they suffer more than is ever guessed by those who, being unlike them, cannot realize that although nothing is said, much is meant. But fortunately there is usually some one person at least who, although unlike, possesses the gift of comprehension. And upon Sidney Stewart this gift had been bestowed. But although she loved Elsie and appreciated to the full her staunch friendship, and remembered that she had stood by her when others had deserted her, when Anne herself had deserted her, she did not care for her as she did for Anne. It was Anne, with her gaiety, her wit, her charm of joyousness, her power to please as well to rule, whose friendship Sidney wanted above all things. All through the vacation, Sidney had tormented herself with thoughts of Anne. Suppose she were to come back more hostile than when she left. Suppose she never again would have anything to do with her. How could she bear it? And what had caused it? Why should the sad events in the past, with which Sidney herself had no connection, have made her dislike her? She did not know. She only knew that she, like Anne Talbot, better than any girl she had ever known and to such an extent that she would gladly forgive her former coldness if only she would be different now 
all that she seemed to care for was to regain the friendship of anne and to-night anne was to arrive and elsie loyal loving elsie guessed that sydney was feeling thus knew what her nervous excitable manner meant and hoped with all her heart that anne would return to school softened by her good times during the holidays it was hard for elsie to forgive her but if sydney would be made happier by anne's friendship she hoped that it might be given her but elsie well knew that it would mean to her a very great change at present she was sydney's only intimate friend in the school she had to fight hard to overcome the jealousy that would make itself felt in spite of all her efforts but there was no doubt that sydney had wished to have her share her room for she had managed to bring it about and in that knowledge elsie felt great satisfaction at about six o'clock that evening the big barge on runners that carried passengers from the railroad station drew up for the second time that day in front of the wickersham school with laughter and chattering one girl after another jumped out ran up the steps of the piazza and into the familiar hall where the teachers and girls who had already arrived stood waiting to welcome the late comers hola ruth how are you dolly oh grace i am so glad to see you again but isn't it hateful to have to buckle down to lessons again now miss jenny you needn't look so shocked you know it yourself these were some of the scattered fragments which were to be heard and talbot having been one of the first to get into the barge was one of the last to get out after shaking hands with the misses wickersham she looked around the group where is sydney she demanded with a pretty imperious manner which made her irresistible to so many of her friends there were very few persons who would not willingly do just what anne desired when she spoke in this way sydney who had drawn a little into the background and was hidden by the crowd of girls heard her above all the hubbub here i am anne she said in a moment anne's arms were around her neck and the bright laughing face sobered for the instant was pressed against hers not a word was said then but sydney knew that for some reason the clouds of misunderstanding had been dispelled and that everything was all right once more but when anne released her and turned to greet someone else sydney looked for elsie she could not speak then but she put her hand in elsie's arm and drew her into the library anne has come back all right she whispered yes i see she has and aren't you glad i am just as glad as i can possibly be i know you are but elsie i want to say something you needn't think that because anne has changed that it will make any difference about us about you and me i mean anne is perfectly fascinating but i don't know about her being very steady at least i don't believe she is as steady as you thank you said elsie in her dry humorous way anne is not as steady as i am and i am not as fascinating as anne well i never supposed i was but there goes the supper bell so it is we must hurry how far down the alphabet did you get while we were away oh we haven't been alphabetical at all we have talked about everything that happened to come into our heads and very soon they were all in their old places at the long table and the cocoa was being poured and the cold meat handed around quite as if there had never been any vacation and while miss wickersham frostily dignified once more spoke in her most learned manner about the subject of tarantulas and passed from that to the introduction of tomatoes into the country the girls all realized that school had begun again 
and that wiki had reached the T's. Bertha Macy had not yet arrived. Miss Wickersham the next morning received a letter from her sister saying that Bertha had a bad cold and the doctor would not allow her to leave home for a few days. He thought, however, that she would be able to take the journey and bear the change to a colder climate by the end of the week. Anne also received a letter, which was from Bertha herself. This was what she wrote. Dear, dearest Anne, Ha! Huh, thought Anne to herself, I suppose I should never be her dear, dearest again. She was awfully mad when she left our house the other night. I am too tried for anything that I can't go back to Kingsbridge with the rest of you. Just fancy the pokiness of coming up alone on Saturday. I have the most fearful cold. I caught it the rainy night I was out, the night of your party. I had the carriage window open coming home, and I had been so warm. I should think she might have been warm, making such an awful mischief, interpolated Anne. What a perfect party that was! I have lots more to tell you about a certain person. You know who. That Mr. Murray was so queer, I couldn't say any more then, but I hadn't told you half of what Julia wrote me. But please don't say anything to Julia about it until I get there. As if I would, said Anne aloud. That is the reason I am so provoked. I couldn't have gone back with you. I didn't want to sit with you and tell you the whole thing in the train. Did you? Well, it takes two to sit together, and you would have been Mademoiselle Trio, thought Anne. Dear Anne, I am perfectly devoted to you. I just long to see you and tell you all this dreadful story. I am so glad you are such a good friend of mine. I would rather be friends with you than with any other girl in school. Would you? thought Anne, looking at these words which were underlined three times. Goodbye now, with fondest love from your very devoted friend, Bertha. As she looked, a sudden thought came to Anne. She examined the writing more carefully. She read the whole letter again. Then she ran upstairs like a whirlwind, so Ruth called after her, whom she had almost knocked down in her haste, and dashing into her room, she eagerly seized the box where she kept her letters and unlocked it. Looking hastily through them, she selected two which she opened. They were the anonymous letters which had been the cause of all her indignation against Sydney. She spread them out on the table, one on either side of the letter which she had just received from Bertha. The T's are exactly alike, she murmured half aloud, and so are the S's. The S in C is just like the S in her Saturday, and the I's are something alike. And here is the same word in Bertha's own letter that is in the second anonymous one person indeed it is in all three of the letters and i do declare it is written very much the same in all what a goose she was not to disguise her hand better for i am perfectly sure now that bertha wrote these letters and not sydney poor old sid how i have been treating her all this time i shall make up for it as much as I possibly can. I am glad of one thing, and that is I was nice to her before I found this out. I felt so dreadfully about their fearful trouble and the hateful story Bertha and Julia had made out of it that I just didn't care whether Sidney wrote these anonymous letters or not. But I am mighty glad, all the same, that she didn't. With her usual rapidity of decision, Anne had already determined absolutely that Bertha was the author of the letters, and nothing could change her. She was as sure as 
of this aspect of the case as she had formerly been of the other she summoned ruth and dolly for a council of war at the first opportunity they studied the three letters and agreed with anne that there was a similarity in portions of the writing but not in all you had better not be too sure that bertha did it anne at least not yet urged the cautious ruth and don't be too hard on bertha added kind-hearted dolly she really believed julia's story and of course she never supposed murray stewart was a brother you see she calls him mr murray in the letter oh dolly you do provoke me cried anne you are always standing up for somebody no matter who it is how can you make any excuses for bertha macy don't i know she did it dolly was silent ruth carter was not she was a little older than anne and although she was very fond of her she was not in the least awed by her imperious nature as perhaps dolly was occasionally that is just the way you talked about sydney anne said she and you may remember that dolly and i begged you to wait and not be so sure that she wrote them yes said anne with unexpected meekness i know you did yes i know i felt sure somehow i always feel sure of a thing it is very inconvenient for it is always getting me into scrapes if i hadn't been so sure it was sydney there wouldn't have been any fuss in school at all probably and that poor dear wouldn't have had to go through having everybody turn against her almost everybody elsie brent stuck to her and you two have always been nice to her but i have been the worst of all just horrid perfectly hatefully horrid what can i do to make up for it i will go find her now she started to her feet but ruth and dolly both held her back don't do anything more until you are sure said ruth even now you know there may be a mistake about bertha having written them it may have been julia clark or someone else but there is her letter i am sure i wasn't thinking of the anonymous letters when i read hers this morning nothing was farther from my thoughts than that she had written them and while i was looking at the idiotic stuff about her being so fond of me oh such stuff in a letter makes me just mad it's so silly it occurred to me that i had never had a letter from bertha before and i wondered why she had written this when she went home from our house the other night in a rather huffy state you know we all noticed her manner and thought we had probably shown her in spite of trying not to that we didn't like her having told that tale well i was reading over the letter as i said when suddenly it came to me that those t's and s's were like somebody else's and i had a letter i had looked at a good deal that had just such t's and s's and what letter could it be and then like a flash it came over me and i rushed up and got out the others and the whole thing was as clear as daylight right straight away well as long as you won't let me tell sydney yet you must advise me what to do to straighten matters out i have been the most to blame in the whole thing as soon as bertha gets here i am going to tell her that murray stewart is sydney's brother and the awful thing she did in speaking in that way before strangers i intended telling her coming up in the train though i shouldn't have sat with her all the way as she suggests not much oh how i hate and despise such underhand dealings as these letters we shall have to turn her out of the kqc that's one thing certain I don't think any of us have been altogether perfect 
about the cake you see said ruth why what do you mean well we didn't kq about sydney before the holidays i think we did that is just what we did do too much perhaps if we had said more instead of just acting as we did we might have gotten at the truth sooner End of chapter 15 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 16 of The Friendship of Anne A Story by Ellen Douglas Deland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. While Bertha was nursing her cold, and her injured feelings in new york she received numerous letters from kingsbridge but much to her disappointment not one of them was from anne talbot she is not going to answer that nice note i wrote her thought bertha already depressed and ready to see everything through the smokiest kind of spectacles i am sure i didn't want to write to her for she made me awfully mad, but I thought it would be better to be pleasant. I wish now I hadn't, as long as she hasn't answered, and from what Julia writes, she has evidently made up with Sydney. Oh dear, I do wish this old cold hadn't come and prevented my going back on the train with Anne. It would have been such a splendid chance to tell her everything. Now, of course, Sydney will prejudice her before I come. It is doubtful if Bertha realized what she was thinking. She would have been surprised if anyone had told her that she had made deliberate plans to spoil Sydney's standing among her schoolmates. She had begun, it is true, by looking down upon Sydney because she was poor and had apparently no social position in new york and then when sydney in her turn looked down upon her and made little effort to disguise the fact that she did not care for bertha and considered her ill-bred bertha also showed her dislike more openly bertha was not the only one at fault for sydney's attitude from the first had been scarcely friendly and thus matters had gone on from bad to worse the anonymous letters had been written with the intention of making known the family affairs of the Stuarts, of which Bertha and Julia had obtained the knowledge in a manner that was anything but honorable, but which had come about partly by accident. Later, when they found that Sydney was suspected of writing the letters, and that the subject of them was supposed by the other girls to be Bertha herself, they had decided not to divulge the truth. If anonymous letters were not approved of, they certainly did not wish to be known as the authors of them. It would never do to tell it, they decided, so they said nothing and allowed Sydney to be held responsible. And then Julia had heard in Baltimore the distorted version of the Stuarts' troubles, and disliking Sydney already, and having already wronged her, as they knew, they were not at all sorry to seize upon what they call disgrace in the family, to justify their own attitude towards her. And now Julia wrote from Kingsbridge to Bertha in New York that Anne Talbot had made up with Sydney, that they had become very intimate, and that Bertha had better hurry back or she would be too late. There is going to be a meeting of the KQC very soon, I believe, and it is said that something is to be said or done. You had better get back before that if you possibly can. I should tell Anne myself if you hadn't made me promise not to. It is really my story for I was the one who found out all about it in Baltimore, and I ought to be the one to tell it. Bertha's cold was certainly most inconvenient, according to her own views, 
but there is no doubt that it was of use to others in her absence there was no one to influence the other pupils to continue their hostility to sydney for julia's was a weaker nature and she was not able to stem the turn in the tide of public opinion anne's attitude was the other one that counted she said nothing in public but it was plainly to be seen that sydney stuart was restored to favor and all the girls followed her lead when bertha finally arrived a week after school opened the first sight that met her eyes when she entered the front door was that of anne and sydney strolling up and down the hall arm in arm in deep conversation oh hello bertha said anne in her most off-hand manner turning her head to speak over her shoulder their course happening to be away from the front door at the moment when bertha came in how is your cold she made no motion towards a warmer greeting sydney on the contrary stopped and turned back don't said anne in a low voice but not too low for bertha to hear however sydney went towards her and held out her hand i hope you are better she said she was feeling very happy these days and full of good will towards everybody even bertha macy she knew nothing of the incident at the talbots new year's eve party she held out her hand but bertha made no response she was too angry with anne to care what was said or done by any one else and she certainly had no intention of being patronized by sydney stuart she said to herself so she ignored her civil greeting and turned to miss wickersham who came out of her room at that minute to welcome her then she went upstairs with julia clark meeting a number of the girls on the way it seemed to her that no one was very cordial to her except miss wickersham and julia she had supposed that quite a crowd would gather at the front door to receive her a week late as she was after having been ill it was all very disappointing and disagreeable and the still faithful julia found that her friend had returned in a frame of mind that was not altogether amiable the next day at the noon recess bertha approached the group in the centre of which anne was standing it was a stormy day and they were forced to remain indoors sydney and elise brent were not there anne said bertha did you get my letter your letter it would be impossible to describe the coldness of anne's tone yes my letter i wrote to you the day after you came back to school did you get it oh yes i think i did get one from you bertha was rapidly growing more provoked the girls were all standing there listening no one saying a word and everyone intensely interested it was a well-known fact that trouble had been brewing and already dark rumors were flying about concerning the projected action of the club committee no one of the uninitiated knew just what was to happen but there was unlimited conjecture and now here were anne and bertha already measuring their swords it was certainly very exciting and of course anne must be in the right to be sure she had done very much the same thing in regard to sydney stuart and now she was friends again with her but still anne must be in the right so it was a distinctly unfriendly group of persons which bertha had approached you know very well you got a letter from me said she how perfectly absurd for you to pretend you have forgotten it well you didn't answer it what was the use when you were coming back so soon what was the use of writing anyway because i had something very important to say you know very well what i began to tell you that night at your party 
there was a great deal more to tell you and i think all the girls ought to know about it it isn't right to keep it from them nobody wants to hear your story bertha said anne it is a miserable story and it isn't true anyhow i advise you not to say one word about it to anybody just forget it forget it repeated bertha scornfully as if such a thing could be forgotten no indeed it ought to be told i for one have no intention of associating with such a person as she is and i think the other girls ought to know about it i am going to tell them just because you have changed towards sydney stuart you were mad enough with her before the holidays just because you have changed there is no reason why hush exclaimed anne imperiously hush i will talk with you this afternoon bertha don't say another word now as sydney and elsie entered the room bertha turned away this conversation had taken place in the schoolroom and going to her desk she fastened its lid up with a prop and began to arrange its contents that is she made a pretense of doing so but in reality while she tossed about her possessions she was peeping over the top of the lid at the group on the other side of the room the girls laughed and talked and recounted their holiday experiences not one of them apparently giving a thought to her if bertha had only availed herself of the opportunity on her return to school to be pleasant with everybody if she had relinquished her plan of making public the affairs of the stuarts if she had not written as she did to anne there is every reason to suppose that she might have remained on good terms with her schoolmates they were no different from other girls not one of them was perfect in disposition or character and of course there would have been quarrels and makings up differences of opinion and occasionally ill temper or perhaps a dishonorable action but on the whole girls are naturally inclined to be friendly with one another anne herself would probably have expressed her opinion to bertha as to her speaking so freely at her party and would have told her the true story of the stuarts and then would have dropped the matter entirely anonymous letters and all and a semblance at least of peace might have been restored but that was not bertha's way absorbed in her own view of the affair which she considered the right view and forgetting entirely that her own conduct had not been by any means honorable she prepared to push matters to an extreme and thus hasten an unfortunate climax that afternoon she and julia clark went to anne's room the hour had been appointed and anne's voice answered their knock dolly fearing was there too and ruth carter of course you don't mind ruth and dolly being here said anne her changeable face showed that she was angry her eyes usually so full of laughter and fun were cold and searching in their expression and there was no suggestion of a smile anywhere she was standing by the table when her visitors entered and on the table was the box where she kept her letters oh no said bertha i would a great deal rather have them here so they can hear the truth julia is going to tell you just what she heard in baltimore she can tell it better than i for she heard it all from her aunt julia a pale girl who looked as though she had not had half the fresh air she needed was apparently very much overwhelmed with a sense of the importance of her position as chief purveyor of scandal she seated herself in the rocking chair to which anne had waved her and began nervously to tilt it to and fro 
Bertha took another chair, and Anne sat down on the edge of the bed. Dolly was curled up in the position of an oriental on her own bed, and Ruth Carter occupied the only remaining chair, which was near the window. Well, why don't you begin? demanded Anne impatiently. Oh, yes, said Julia with a little laugh that betrayed her agitation of mind. I will. I didn't know Bertha was going to make me tell it. Then she paused. Oh, do go ahead, Julia, exclaimed Bertha. I don't believe she has much to tell after all, said Anne, in a tone that suggested scorn. I have, too, replied Julia, strung into speech. It is an awful thing that happened. My aunt never knew these people herself, the Stuarts, I mean. Naturally, she wouldn't, for they must be very common. One of the boys, one of Sidney Stuart's brothers, actually killed another boy. They tried to make out that it was an accident, but someone who was near had heard them quarreling just before the gun went off. He was about fourteen when it happened, and the judges and jury and lawyers and everybody felt so sorry for him because he was so young that they didn't do anything to him. But there's no doubt about its being true, for the Stuarts never held up their heads afterwards, and they moved away from Baltimore and went to New York to live, so that no one should know about it, and the brother is a blighted being. Of course that proves that he did it on purpose, and it wasn't an accident. If it had been, he would get over it. That Mr. Murray, who was at your party, Anne, said that he knew them and that everybody knew it was an accident, said Bertha. He was just trying to stand up for them because they happened to be friends of his, I suppose. It was all in the papers at the time. It is the most disgraceful thing to have happen in your family, I think. The idea of Sydney coming to a boarding school and passing herself off to be as good as anybody. It is perfectly outrageous. Have you quite finished your side of the story? asked Anne. Yes, except to tell you that I know for a fact that she is here at half rates. She is a sort of charity scholar. I should think that was Miss Wickersham's affair, said Ruth. I don't see what difference it makes to us what the different girls' bills are. I don't suppose it does, except to show what kind of people the Stuarts are. Think of their accepting such a favor from a boarding school teacher. You would think they would be ashamed to. How did you find that out? asked Anne. Did Julia's aunt in Baltimore tell you that? Bertha colored and was silent. Evidently, you can't give your authority for that. Well, I don't think much of that part of your news, then, for I don't believe it is true. It is, cried Bertha hotly. It is perfectly true. The Stuarts acknowledge it themselves. How do you know they do? Did Sydney ever tell you herself? Of course not. Then I can only suppose you found it out while you were rooming together, and people who find things out in that way, Anne, interposed Ruth, wouldn't it be just as well to tell Bertha and Julia the real truth of the other story? After all, it doesn't make the slightest difference to any of us about the Stuarts' arrangements with Miss Wickersham, but the other story is important, and everyone ought to know the truth. All right, we will let the other go for the present, said Anne. Ruth is right. You ought to know the real facts of the important part of your tale. First I will tell you, Bertha, that the other night at our house you were talking to Sidney Stewart's own brother. You actually said in his presence, 
that his brother was a murderer. "'What do you mean?' cried Bertha. "'There was no one there named Stuart.' "'Yes, there was. Murray Stuart. It was he who told you that you were mistaken.' "'Murray Stuart? I thought that fellow's last name was Murray.' "'Well, you made a great mistake then, and I am just going to tell you now, without paint or polish or any other trimming, that I was very, very much provoked with you and awfully ashamed of you for telling such a story at my house before people who were strangers to you. You didn't know but what they were all cousins of the Stuarts.' or intimate friends, or something, and there one of them did turn out to be one of the very family, own brother to the boy himself. I think it was very, very nice of him, and showed what a true gentleman he is, that he didn't tell you then and there who he was. As for the Stuarts, being common, as you and Julia seem to think, they are not so at all. They are a very old family. The Stuarts came from Massachusetts, and Mrs. Stuart herself belonged to an old Maryland family. My mother and my aunt have always known her, and my brother and Fred Merriman and Alec Tracy were classmates of Murray when he was at Harvard, and knew him very well indeed. They haven't been living in New York long, and that is why my mother didn't know they were there, and why I didn't know that she knew Sidney's family, until I went home for these holidays. That is why you have taken up Sidney again, I suppose, said Bertha. You have found out that, as far as her family goes, she is a proper person to know. That is not the reason i have another reason a much better one you know very well that i liked her from the beginning but i allowed myself to be deceived about her i am sorry enough for it now anne interposed ruth one more better keep to the most important manner and tell bertha the true story of the accident well i shall saddle the other later Everybody who was anybody in Baltimore knew at the time, and knows now, that Philip Stewart and the Appleton boy who was killed were most intimate friends. They had been all their lives. The Appleton boy did not live there, but he came there every year to visit his father's relations, who were named Appleton. His father and mother were dead, and he lived somewhere else with his grandmother. Whenever he came south, he spent all his time with Phil Stewart. One day they went out shooting together, just as they had often done before. They did have a quarrel about something, but it was nothing serious. Just as boys often squabble, or girls either, as do that. Dolly and I often fight. But if one of us were to die suddenly after a fuss, I don't suppose any one would think we had murdered each other. And no one whose opinion was worth anything thought it about Phil Stewart. But he felt dreadfully about the quarrel. He told about it right away, and he has never been able to get over it. His gun went off accidentally, and the other boy was close to him. Oh, it was awful. He died right away, I believe, before there was time to do anything for him, or for him to say anything. It was in the country near Baltimore, where the Stuarts had a place, and the Appletons lived next door. Phil Stewart ran right to the family and told them he had done it. Of course, there was no judge or jury or anything. There was an inquest, and Philip was completely exonerated. But some horrid sensational paper got hold of it and published the story the way you heard it. I suppose your aunt read that paper, Julia. You say she didn't know the Stuarts herself, 
so of course she didn't hear the rights of the case. But I can tell you that among the nice people of Baltimore, there has never been any other opinion than what I have told you. They had a great many warm friends, but they are very, very proud and very sensitive. Philip is particularly sensitive, my brother says. He has never gotten over his misery and takes an exaggerated view of everything connected with it. He feels all the more awfully because his last words with his friend were disagreeable, quarrelsome ones. Oh, I do feel so sorry for that poor fellow. I don't see why they didn't stay in Baltimore, where you say they were such nice people, said Bertha. What made them come to New York if they had nothing to be ashamed of? Because Mr. Stewart died, and they were left very poorly off, and the boys had to leave college and go to work, and they could get better positions in New York than they could in Baltimore. It is easy enough to understand that. Now, Bertha, I want to ask you something. Have you told any of the other girls the story? I know you told them before the holidays that there was some disgrace, but have you told anyone just what it is? No, returned Bertha shortly. Then I advise you not to say another word. If you do, we will tell the true story, and it is much better not to have any more talk about it. It wouldn't do you any good. You may be sure of that. Bertha made no reply. She recognized the wisdom of Anne's statement, but she was unwilling to acknowledge it. And one more thing, said Anne, tapping the box that held her correspondence. The sooner you own up to having written those anonymous letters about Sydney, the better it will be for you. Bertha fairly jumped. Her confusion would have been evident to the most casual observer. In a moment, however, she regained her composure. She rose to her feet. Come along, Julia, she said. There is no use in staying here any longer to be insulted. The two went out of the room and turned to her friends. There, said she, what do you think of that? I think it is dreadful, exclaimed Dolly, almost in tears. Ruth was silent. End of chapter 16 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 17 of The Friendship of Anne, a story by Ellen Douglas Delan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A few days after this, when the clang of the rising bell awoke Sydney and Elsie Brent, one cold frosty morning when it was yet dark, and while they were sleeping, inquiring of each other if it could possibly be time to get up, they were aroused to complete wakefulness by strange sounds upon their door. There were three loud taps in succession, which were repeated, after a brief interval of silence, three times. Sydney quickly opened the door. As she did, so something fell into the room with a clatter, which caused her to jump back and give a little scream of surprise. "'What in the world is it?' demanded Elsie, fumbling for the matches. "'I don't know. Do light the candle quick.' As she spoke, she heard the scuffing of feet in a distant part of the hall, and a half-suppressed laugh. The lighty candle revealed a broomstick clothed in a skirt and shawl, with a towel wrapped about the broom part to resemble a hood. In the dusk of the early morning, it was rather startling to have such an object fall upon one when one opened the bedroom door, and Sydney felt that she had been justified in her shriek. Pinned to the shawl was a sheet of paper on which were written the following lines. 
Sydney and Elsie are very nice girls who never make frizzes and never wear curls, but with dear little braidings they do up their hair and smooth it and tie it and fix it with care. They never tell stories nor write horrid letters, inventing strange tales and insulting their betters. And so we all like them and want them to night when the candles are lighted and stars shining bright to come to a room on the second floor front it is easily found but if not they must hunt where a feast will be spread with some goodies from town for a box has been sent to dear marion brown don't mention this summons nor breathe to a creature that a party is on if you do when i meet yer you'll be sorry enough that you didn't obey the kq has ordered there's no more to say but that nine is the hour and mum is the word if you whisper a sound you are sure to be heard elsie and sydney read this poem with an interest that may easily be imagined what do they mean asked sydney the beginning is so queer it all seems like a hit at bertha the frizzes and curls part but this about writing letters i remember you kept talking about letters elsie when i first began to know you well what letters were written oh don't ask me anything said elsie i don't want to have anything to do with it if you want to know ask anne or somebody else but as long as the fuss has blown over and you and Anne are all right again, what is the use of saying anything more about it? I suppose they had some reason for putting that in the beginning of the invitation. I suppose they wanted us to understand why they liked us and were ready to take us back into favor. They have always liked you, said Sydney. I was the one. Well, there's evidently going to be a feast in Marion Brown's room. Yes, it will be fun. I suppose Anne wrote this. She is so fond of rhyming. She read the lines again. If you don't hurry up and begin to braid your hair and smooth it and tie it and fix it with care, you'll be late to breakfast and get a reprimand and perhaps get punished and perhaps not be able to go to the feast prophesied elsie darkly oh goody exclaimed sydney recalled to the present moment i forgot all about breakfast now who but anne would have ever thought of going to all this trouble and dressing up a broomstick to bring the summons what will she do next i wonder if bertha got a poem but when the members assembled at the appointed hour that evening bertha macy and julia clark were not among them they had received no invitation of any kind much less a poem and the affair had been carried through with such secrecy that they were as yet ignorant of the fact that a feast was to be held by nine o'clock in the evening every girl at the wickersham school was supposed to be in bed Miss Abby had made the usual round of the rooms, tapping at each door, and after asking if each girl was there and needed nothing, had bidden good night to each by name and gone on her way downstairs with the pleasant consciousness of having performed her duty. It can scarcely be imagined that the Mrs. Wickersham did not know that these feasts were occasionally held after bedtime but as they did not occur very often and were usually of not very long duration the teachers no doubt considered it wiser to pay no attention to them and if possible to keep up a semblance of ignorance they had sufficient experience to know that girls will be girls as well as boys boys but the members of the kqc did not credit the Mrs. Wickersham with so much forbearance, and the most thrilling part of their evening meetings 
was the necessity for secrecy and quiet so shortly after nine o'clock with stealthy movements and extreme caution one after another the girls who had been bidden crept out of their rooms and silently stole towards that of marion brown no one knocked but turned the handle of her door as noiselessly as possible and entered not a word was said at first when nine girls had assembled anne talbot who had been sitting on the floor in a corner of the room rose to her feet she spoke in a loud piercing whisper i think you are all here who were summoned she said will the secretary please call the roll the secretary did as she was commanded every name was answered in the same shrill whisper now commanded anne lock the door this was done and now the feast was the president's next order without a word marian brown and her roommate gertrude king opened the closet door there was a movement of breathless suspense when the hostess turned again towards the company it was a difficult matter for the company to repress its enthusiasm there was a large cake with icing there were quantities of little cakes along with icing white pink and brown there were oranges and bananas there was oh joy of joys a coconut marian brown was particularly fond of a coconut in its natural shape and marian brown's family knew it in fact she had never allowed them to forget the fact there was a large box of assorted candies and another containing only chocolates there were crackers and olives and pickles and nuts and crowning delicacy a jar of orange marmalade is it any wonder that the members of the kqc found it a difficult thing to limit the expression of their appreciation to a whisper the whispers became a sibilant hiss of delight and when these dainties were arranged upon the bed the table was far too small to accommodate the half of them the girls needed no invitation to draw nearer of course there were not chairs enough even though some of the nearer neighbors had carried them in from their rooms so those who had none knelt about the bed which after all brought them closer to the center of attraction than would any commonplace chair the little cates had been distributed the large one was in the act of being cut marian had just began to meditate on the best means of noiselessly opening the coconut when a thrilling sound broke upon their ears some one was trying the handle of the door how long it had already continued no one knew it was evident that the person whoever it may be was being impatient the girls looked at one another for the briefest instant quick whispered anne and caught up the corner of the bedspread marian and gertrude on the other side followed her example before the others could fully grasp the situation the spread had been gathered into the shape of a bag and in that bag rolled the reckless confusion the cakes candy fruit marmalade nuts and pickles which so short a time before had been so had been temptingly displayed upon the bed into the closet went the goodies and with them went two of the girls two more hid behind the head of the bed which jutted out from the wall three crawled underneath and gertrude king jumped into it pulling the coverings well up over her head this left two girls unprovided for and they proved to be marian brown and anne talbot anne put her hand to her head and rocked to and fro in pretended anguish i've got an awful headache she whispered or some dreadful pain of some kind that's why i'm here i came for your mustard plasters or something oh this pain this pain 
her groans became so fervid and heart-rendering that the girls under the bed began to giggle hysterically hush moaned anne my head my head in the meantime the rattling of the door handle had continued with unabated vigor and determination it is probably miss wickersham herself whispered gertrude emerging for a brief moment from the bedclothes marion do open the door and act as if you were very sleepy marion did as she was bidden she drew the bolt yawned opened the door a crack who is it she asked is it you miss abby she opened the door a little further only to behold bertha macy and julia clark let us in let us in whispered bertha we never got our summons and only found out by the merest chance that you are having a feast she pushed her way in as she spoke closely followed by julia marion brown who was not of the secret committee and therefore knew nothing of its projected action in regard to bertha and julia made no effort to prevent their coming in fact she was too much surprised to say or do anything the other girls emerged from their hiding places gertrude sat up in bed and anne her head making remarkably quick recovery stood spellbound in the middle of the room for once she was at a loss for words not so bertha however where is the feast she asked i don't see a sign of anything to eat i hope you haven't eaten it all up before we got here that would be too mean this speech put the finishing touch to anne's indignation which had been rapidly increasing during her silence perhaps because of it she took a step forward bertha macy she exclaimed you certainly are the worst i ever did know she made a perceptible pause after each word which was very impressive even the intrepid bertha felt a thrill of something that resembled fear don't you know continued anne that people don't usually go to parties unless they are invited she quite forgot to whisper i do know said bertha also in a loud voice that this is a club meeting and we're members of the club and ought to be here no you ain't no you're not you're not members you have been dropped do you think we'd have members that wrote anonymous letters about other members and told scandal and read other people's letters for i am perfectly sure that is what you did anne said dorothy fearing are you saying too much you mustn't you don't really know and you oughtn't to talk that way before all the other girls as she said this her kind little face full of distress bertha turned and looked at her then without a word bertha and julia left the room now said anne let's go on with the feast she opened the closet door and lifted up the mass of stuff jumbled into the spread as she turned with it in her arms there was another knock upon the door of the room and almost immediately it was opened from without this time the newcomer was miss abby wickersham young ladies there seems to be a great deal of noise this evening miss talbot why are you here miss carter too and miss fearing why what does this mean why are you not all in your rooms and in bed it was a question or rather a series of questions that no one seemed inclined or able to answer i shall report the matter at once to miss wickersham continued miss abby in the meantime go to your own rooms without a moment's delay what are you hiding in that bundle miss talbot why what is it it looks like the bedspread but what is dropping from it put it down on the floor if you please and open
open it anne did as she was told miss abby looked at its contents and gave an exclamation of astonishment mingled with disgust what is this horrid stuff she demanded cake pickles broken glass carry it down at once to the kitchen and let it be thrown away you have ruined the spread young ladies the whole affair is disgraceful go to your rooms immediately miss talbot when you have carried that to the kitchen you may come to miss wickersham's study miss king and miss brown please come with me i am completely astonished at such conduct it was certainly a tragic ending to marion brown's box from home the culprits did as they were bidden and when they finally emerged from miss wickersham's study and retired once more to their rooms they wore the aspect of punished dogs although miss wickersham's only whip had been her caustic tongue the matter did not end here however anne talbot being perfectly convinced that bertha and julia had retaliated upon them for not being invited to the party by informing miss abby of it determined to take strenuous measures at once the secret committee held a secret meeting the following day and a formal notice was drawn up in which bertha and julia were informed that they were no longer considered desirable members of the k q c you are hereby informed so ran the notice in what was considered fine legal phraseology that you are suspended for ever from taking part in the meetings of the KQC. You are herein notified that the KQC means KQC and that KQC means Keep Quiet Club. To keep quiet means not to tell tales, not to make up things, not to gossip, not to say disagreeable things about anybody, not to be hateful in any way, shape or manner the secret committee thinks you have been all these things and therefore the k q c bids you farewell it will be to your advantage now to keep quiet this notice was to be sent to the two girls the next day as soon as it should be properly copied by the secretary of course there was much excitement and speculation in the school about the whole affair the interrupted feast the displeasure of miss wickersham and above all the dark suspicion that bertha and julia had been the means of be it becoming known to the teachers bertha and julia were let severely alone and anne was the centre of the largest group as usual elsie brent refused to take any part in the proceedings but went off by herself, and Sydney and Dolly hovered anxiously on the outskirts of Anne's circle. At last Dolly could bear it no longer. She disliked a quarrel with all her heart, and she determined to do what she could to mend matters. The first thing necessary was to take Sydney into her confidence, and therefore she asked her to walk with her in the afternoon they hurried to the path through the woods and over the hill where they would be safe from interruption there was little snow to be seen now and the day was mild for the season of the year although the ground was still frozen sydney said dorothy plunging at once into her subject something has got to be done i think anne is too hard on bertha we don't really know that she told miss abby we were making a lot of noise last night and very likely miss abby heard us and was coming anyway to find out what it was of course that is not the only reason they are turning these girls out of the k q c but because of you because of me repeated sydney yes i hate to speak of it but i really think i'd better of course you know about those letters no i don't i've heard about letters 
but I never really knew. I was perfectly miserable at Thanksgiving time, and until after Christmas, because Anne was so queer and cool to me, and I knew there were letters mixed up in it somehow, but I didn't ask her about them when we became friends again, because I just couldn't, and Elsie advised me to let things go without any more talking. Elsie has a lot of sense. But it concerns more than you now, and I think you ought to know. In a few words, Dorothy told her the whole story. The letters, the affair at the Talbots, Bertha and Julia's version of the Stuarts' troubles, Anne's indignation, her sudden conviction that Bertha had written the letters, and now the determination to dismiss Bertha and Julia from the club. Now, continued Dorothy, I want to know what you think. Of course, it was an awful thing for Bertha to do, perfectly hateful, and she has made a great deal of trouble. But at the same time, I don't think any of us were perfect. We all talk too much, and we have thought things. We none of us have kept the rules of the club about being quiet. Oh, Sydney. I hope I haven't said too much. No, you haven't, said Sydney, struggling to retain her composure. I'm glad you told me the whole thing, Dolly. It was kinder to do so. But of course it, it makes me terrible to know that poor Phil has been so much talked about and, and such awful things said. But no one believed them, Sydney. Not one person believed it was the way Julia's aunt said it was. And Anne, and all of us love you all the better for having been through so much. Yes, I know. I feel all right about Anne's friendship now and yours, Dolly. And Elsie has been my friend all the way through. And now what do you want me to do? Why, said Dolly simply, I want you to be kind to Bertha and Julia. I don't believe they really meant to be as hateful as they were, and you are the only one who can get things straightened out. What I mean is that if you are willing, I will talk to Anne and talk to Bertha. I think Bertha has more to do with it than Julia, and see if I can patch up a piece. End of chapter 17. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.